Welcome to the fall 2014 edition of Inside Rice University. I'm Gabe Baker. I'm really excited to share with you some of the cool and unconventional things going on at Rice this semester. Like the latest installation behind me at the Rice Gallery, which is painted completely out of dirt. The fall semester started off with a touching story. Rice students have been working for more than four years to help a local team. See how the hard work finally paid off. Taylor has arthrogryposis, which is a condition where two or more major joints don't have very good mobility from birth on. He simply doesn't have a lot of mobility in his joints, so he can't walk on his own, he needs a wheelchair, but on top of that, he can't even move his wheelchair in the typical way, the way wheelchairs are normally moved, because he doesn't have that kind of mobility in his shoulder, his elbow, his wrist, his hand, none of it. A power chair isn't an option for him because they're very, very big, they're very, very heavy. They can't get in and out of their car, it doesn't work in their home, so it's just simply not an option for him. So he needs a manual wheelchair that he can manually push with his own, within his own abilities. When I first got, got here, people had to push me around almost, well, the whole time because I couldn't move the wheelchair by myself. The project to develop a better wheelchair for Pedro was actually pitched in NG120 in spring 2011. That was the first semester that Engineering 120 was offered at Rice. What I quickly learned is that the project was very challenging for first-year engineering students. Over time, a number of teams have tackled this problem, and then finally we got a team that stuck. So I very vividly remember the day that, that the project changed. We didn't really think that we were gonna be able to do it. We were like, you know, when, when does this end? Like, what, like, when does Rice say that this can't be done? Because at that point, we didn't think it could be done. And Dr. Satterbeck says, you guys are the last hope. So like, if you guys can't do it, then we tell Pedro that he doesn't get a wheelchair. Just like, all right, like, this is it. Like, failure is not an option. We have to do, you know, anything and whatever it takes and learn everything we have to do to get this kid a wheelchair because we just can't fail him. The biggest challenge with Pedro is that he can't pull his muscles back, he can't retract his arms. So we really had to go through and find a way that he could, you know, use a wheelchair. And, you know, the rowing motion we have is great, and then pulling it back has a lot of problems with it, but we've faced them all and gone through to make sure that he can actually use a motion to move the wheelchair. So we actually found this product that exists currently called the Widget, which we used as our gearing system. And while the widget is great, we still had to make additional modifications so that Pedro could use it. We have a couple of really neat features on the wheelchair. One of them is we were able to take a pair of standard bicycle caliper brakes and invert their direction so that they grab onto the wheelchair in the direction not normally used in a bicycle. And this allowed us to be able to change the way that typical hand caliper brakes are just a squeeze motion. We were able to adjust it so that it's a knee flare. Um, actually outwards that allows him to engage the brakes on both sides independently which gives him a greater turning radius on either side. We've gotten to work with a lot of different people. I mean Reed is an art history major so we've spanned everywhere from engineering to even the art side of campus. I mean I had absolutely no idea but I think I came to the school with this in mind. In a very abstract sense I wanted to be around something that I thought would be different than I would get going to a place um, perhaps more curtailed towards my particular interests. And I wanted to be around this type of environment where I would be pushed in different directions, uh, you know, to end up, I guess, on the what, sixth floor of Shiner's Hospital. <laughs> it's been a real gift. Nice. Thank you for the time and your dedication no, to everything. Yeah. There are many words to express that. Mm -hmm. Pedro's mom especially was so overcome with emotion at the end and she kept saying how she didn't have the words to describe what was going on but she didn't need them because like the feeling of the moment and like the evidence of Pedro raising his sister down the hallway and being able to do all these things for the first time like that transcended like anything that words could have said.
What can sociology students learn from an architect? Find out in this story as we follow a tour of Houston. So this class is Sociology 308, Houston, the sociology of a city. And it basically portrays how Houston transformed over the period since 1836 to today, how it really became a city of, of business elites and pro-growth politics over time, and um, what the future of, of Houston is and how it reflects the future of the United States, especially demographically. So we're in for a, a wonderful opportunity to see this city through the eyes of someone who knows it better than anybody else in Houston. Today we took a bus tour with the uh, architectural historian Stephen Fox as part of Professor Kleinberg's class and it was really interesting just going through different aspects of, of Houston and different neighborhoods but sort of seeing a story through time. Here at the intersection of uh, Montrose Boulevard and Hawthorne which would once have seemed kind of like the center of the uh, social world in Houston. Uh, you know, the, the, the mansions are gone, a few of the street trees remain, uh, but the you know, kind of Starbucks, uh, that uh, uh, outpost of uh, turn of the 21st century uh, corporate conviviality uh, uh, is reassuringly here. The central function of the class is each of the students is doing major individual projects, all focused on how well is Houston addressing the central challenges that it faces. A lot having to do with education, a lot having to do with quality of life and making a more beautiful city that can attract the talent of the 21st century, and a lot of that having to do with building this multi-ethnic world that is, that is upon us. And so this was just a wonderful opportunity to see the, 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 the spatial structures around which so many of these central sociological issues are, are, are going to be developed. Well, here we proceed to what historically was called the South End, today Midtown. On both sides of the street, uh, the kind of, from my perspective, rather demonic building type that's taking over Houston called the platform building. We talk about a lot in class are the theories of urban planning. So like in the 1910s, 1920s, how Houston, there was a lot of urban planning with like the Main Street Corridor and Rice, and it was a really deliberate attempt to make all this green public space. And then after World War II, how that kind of changed and it became a lot more privatized and more focused on the suburban ideal um, and how that affected Houston. And you can really see it like driving straight down Main Street is like going through phases of urban theory and things like that. So that's really cool. $11 million. That's the funding for a team of Rice experts launching a four-year effort to create autocorrect for programmers. The Pliny Project at Rice, spelled P-L-I-N-Y, is about taking all the available code in the world and putting it in a database. Imagine that the stack of papers represents all the code that we've been able to amass. And it's not just a matter of putting the text of the code in the database. We want to extract interesting features like functions, variables, dependencies, and put them all in the database. Now that we have this, terabytes of data, our big core database, the question is, how can we use it to help programmers to write new code or to fix old code. So here, I'm representing this visually as a piece of paper, a piece of code with a hole in it. Now what Pliny is gonna do is that it's gonna take this incomplete piece of code and generate a query to the Pliny database. Now the Pliny database is now going to take this query and search this large corpus of pre-existing code snippets. And not all of them are going to be good fits for the program that the programmer wrote. Eventually, Pliny will come back with something that's the best fit. We see that the best fit is pretty good, but it doesn't fit exactly. Now, what Pliny is gonna do is just trim this piece of code, this snippet retrieved from the database around the edges using sophisticated analysis techniques, give it back to the programmer, and here we see we have a result that fits what the programmer already wrote. We have an exciting road ahead of us as we try to convert this Pliny vision into reality. RICE has been historically strong in programming languages, and we now have a growing strength in big data. And the exciting part about this project is that the two are really going to come together. At the forefront of education stands a small school with a big story one of pioneers, leaders, and entrepreneurs, of Oscars, Pulitzers, and Nobel Prizes. A story of the world's most brilliant minds working together 
to challenge convention, making discoveries that will change the course of history and innovations that will change everything. Rice University, advancing the world with unconventional wisdom. Welcome back to Inside Rice University. Rice Rising, that's the new model for the men's basketball team. But that model probably could be applied to the whole athletics program right now. The Rice Isles women's soccer team claimed the 2014 Conference USA championship title. The Owls shut out North Texas 2 to nothing on Charlotte, North Carolina to clinch an automatic bid to the NCAA tournament. Rice will be making the program's third trip to the NCAA's big dance after claiming the school's second Conference USA tournament crown. Uh, it, it was a very special moment. I mean, this is something we've been working so hard for. You know, it's something we set our standards really early in the season that a conference championship was a priority for us. So to see that come true for them and to see them smile and celebrate the way they did was pretty amazing. For us seniors, being here four years, we've really seen up, down, pretty much everything you could do from the bottom to the top we've done. But for the program, I mean, it's a, it's a game changer. It's hard to go out there and win the tournament. The men's basketball team has a new head coach, Mike Rhodes, and a new focus. The training and practices have been intense. See for yourself in the next few stories. Hit somebody, don't be soft. Let's go. Excuses make you a loser. We're not losers in here. Drive. Let's do something that people don't think we can do. Let's make this program a game on the schedule that people don't want to play us. You got to rise a, a, above how you used to play. You got to get other guys to rise up because you can't do it all alone and we're doing it together. Right, you didn't get it right away, you got to block. That's awesome. Do that all the time. We'll get all that right, that's on us. You keep that effort up, good job. Coach Rhodes, he, he brought this in. Um, you can see a lot of the posters around the gym, Rice Rising. That's how hard you're gonna go after the ball, then just, just push the tire, go and take a boxing class. But it's standing there, a kid can hit you right in the face, go get that ball! I can see where we're probably one of the hardest working teams in the nation, uh, just because of Coach Rhodes. And you know, the guys are tired, we're hurting, but he, he makes it, it's, it's a mental thing. Um, and you know, we just gotta get through it and uh, come out and compete every day. Owen, go, go, go with it, go with it! It's gonna be fun to watch. Um, as you saw from practice, it's uh, high speed, uh, fast pace, and so I think it's gonna be a little more exciting uh, to watch than it has been in the past. Being accountable and holding each other accountable to a high level, that's what we want. You understand, like raise the bar around here, raise it. It's uh, 4.45 a.m. and we're outside of the Rice Rec, um, right next to the pool. Rice University, men's basketball team. Uh, we're heading to this Navy SEAL training. I'm not really sure what to expect, but we're just here ready to go. Yeah. Coach Rose says this might be the hardest thing we, uh, we've ever done in our life. When you spend so much time together as a basketball team and as a coaching staff, you want to be able to go into any mission, any, any game, any type of competition knowing we got each other's back that we're all in this together, we're not going to let anybody hang, and in the end, you, you find ways to win. You, you, you go on the road and beat teams on the road you're not supposed to beat, or you have a tough game, you find a way to finish it. And we get to a point where there's just no excuses. Our job is to take care of each other and find ways to win. I don't want to hear no whining, and I'm not accepting any quitters today. Understand? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let's go! Let's go! Let's go, y'all! When you suffer together,
together. You win together. Let's go. Get together, get together. London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. London Bridge is falling down. My dear This is day one of three, and I mean, our workouts normally aren't that easy either. This is just another level. Uh, this is probably one of the toughest workouts I've probably had in my life. I got you, coach. Rayman, our guys, they're never in the back to get yelled at, but never in the front to push themselves. To push themselves. They're right in the middle. I call them gray men. They're just there. Don't just, be just there. Just there, don't win championships. Just there, don't make your, make your team special. You guys got that? Yep. Yeah. You want to be gray men in the real world? No. You want to work for somebody every day? No. Or you want to own the company? Own That's how we got to be. Everybody Mike, in. Mike, Mike, hey, hey, right. academics. You guys got a great discipline with your sleep, your eating, and your academics these next three nights now. Yeah. Stone you on. No, no excuses. Not. You got to get up early. Do not be late for class. No one. know that. Everybody, everybody <laughs> on your shit. Instructor G, get in. You say one, two, three. One, two, three. Family. The women's team lost their all time leading scorer, Jessica Custer, when she graduated last year but five seniors are confident they can rebound and have a great season. We're gonna put on a show. We're gonna have fun doing what we're doing and we're just gonna play for rice. People should come watch Rice Women's Basketball just because when we go, we play with so much heart and passion and you're going to see us out there having fun and just enjoying the game of basketball and I think that's really fun to watch. The heart is just incredible. If you come out and just watch our practices, like, I'm sure people can hear us down the hall because we're just yelling and screaming for each other. Well, they've come in with really good attitudes and, and very enthusiastic in practice and last year uh, with Jessica being our only senior, uh, she did a tremendous job. Uh, of trying to be a leader, but, but it's very hard when you're the only senior. And this year we have five seniors and, and they all are uh, stepping up and, and taking some responsibility, which they need to as a senior, uh, to be leaders on and off the court. I think this team is very close-knit and, and really play hard and, and like each other. And, you know, team chemistry is, is very strong and that, that many times can uh, carry through a lot of other problems that may occur. Okay, so my quote of the day is the struggle that you're in today is developing the strength that you need for tomorrow. And so Wendy, you were a great example of that last practice when you were getting yelled at for a lot of stuff. Like it just developed your strength for many practices to come and games and all that. And so as encouragement to everybody else, like when you're getting harped on in practice or you haven't done like two things in a row wrong, like it's developing your strength for the next day and you're going to be better. So just use it as positivity to look ahead. The Rice Rowing Club team probably does more before 8 a.m. than most people do all day. Check out how they are helping to transform Buffalo Bayou east of downtown Houston. When I tell people that I'm on the rowing team, they're like, wait, Rice has a rowing team? A rowing team is just like a very specialized sport that not a lot of people know too much about. And so it's exciting for us to be able to experience that at a college level and at such a competitive level. We had a very long sit down last year with the team and said, you know, we need to know where we're going. Is this, do we want to treat this like a club sport or do we want to just be a varsity team that is under the club sport umbrella? Good, good. Regular power. They, they wanted to compete. That was, that was their desire for them to compete and get competitive. Um, we told them to expect six days a week. Turn six, ready to row? They've carried that drive to the new members. We were practicing out of a boathouse in Seabrook. It's called Bay Area Rowing Club. They're a great club, uh, but it was just not practical for our purposes. We were driving 45 minutes one way to get out there, and we just wanted to be able to move to an area where we would be safer. Like, it would be safer driving. I mean, we have a 15-minute commute now. Pause, drop the pause. We are on um, pretty deep east side, downtown being 
right over by us. Um, we're in Edo. We set up this area because Buffalo Bayou Partnership, um, they're kind of the stewards of the bayou all over the city. They had a vision of building a series of boathouses out here, and um, we kind of led that charge. We learned about it and picked up their plans from where they left off about 10 years ago so that we could build our own and get rice crew out here rather than going all the way out to Clear Lake. I was a part of the, the first eight-man boat to row on Buffalo Bayou in Houston, so that was really cool. Something I'll tell my grandkids, you know, eventually. Rice is a very academic environment. It's very stressful academically on these students, and you know they, they have a good social network that supports them. But for a lot of students, if you're not a varsity athlete, some of these teams are aren't what they're looking for, you know. And I think crew filled that void for the students that we work with. That it's it's competitive. That it's 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 fun. The, the camaraderie that's involved. Um, and so that honestly is what drove us to do this. Is that so we could build something for them so that the team could could keep that growing. This is a total labor of love. Um, Mike and I are volunteers and we are totally happy doing what we're doing. We believe in what this can provide students that the classroom alone cannot. And this teaches them things like unity, um, support for each other, leadership. It's very hard to replicate in any other experience that we can just produce. One, two, three. Rise Who knew concrete could be permeable, filtering rain into the soil instead of our lakes and streams? Or that a mathematical equation could open our ears to music we've never heard? Or that a happy home could cost less than a family car? Who knew we could build an elevator to space? Rice, unconventional wisdom. Welcome back. A lot of people do their best to stay away from bugs, but one rice class goes out of their way to find them. There you are, there you are. I see you. Bugs all day, bugs all day. I put the in an insect. This I think is a spur-throated grasshopper. I put the in an insect. Got one! I'm going to coin that. It's going to be a shirt. You'll be the first one to buy it. Oh, I know what that is. This class is called Insect Biology Lab. It's a lab that's a companion to a lecture course on insect biology. We're really proud of this place, and um, it's obviously quite different than what was here. So a lot of our labs feature this uh, outdoor kind of field experience, which we feel is really important for students who are studying ecology and evolutionary biology. Here you go. So we're at the Cook's Branch Conservancy, and so one of the things that's really exciting about coming out here is that it's a large expanse of a natural environment that's been restored over the last few decades, and it's close to Houston. So there's very few places that are this large that have natural environments that are you know, close proximity to Houston where we can actually go and give students an opportunity to be out in the field in nature and see some of the native species of insects that we have in the area. We're excited about new partnerships that really open uh, the Conservancy up to research opportunities and this partnership with Rice is the perfect example. Rice brings an excellent um, standard of research, right? Excellent reputation, excellent professors. Also it's a small and manageable size which was important for us because we don't we haven't we don't have the infrastructure and the staff to really accommodate large groups. In Houston, the city, you wouldn't see trees like this. You wouldn't look up and just see the sky just wide open. So I do this catching and bug and all this bug catching because it's fun, stress relieving. I just love being out there, getting dirty, getting nitty gritty. Check out these dudes. So there's a couple of things that we'll be able to look at that will give us an idea of how the environment is doing by looking at insect diversity. One is the sheer number of species that we find in a particular spot. So a place that has greater number of insect species is probably doing better from an environmental perspective. But also we can look at what those species are. So if we find a lot of invasive species of insects, that's an indication that the environment's not doing so well. If we're finding a lot of native species and not as many invasive species, then that's an indication that the environment's doing well. Something that they discover here can assist in assessing what practices are best or what, what you know, makes for a healthy ecosystem, then we can disseminate that information to other landowners or to the community. Nice find, yo. That is freaking humongo. 
I think the students get a lot out of this kind of experience when they're able to come and do a project that they're given a little bit of direction on, but really at the end of the day it's up to them. They choose exactly how they're going to sample. We bring them to the spot and then we give them an opportunity to kind of explore, look around, indulge their curiosity, and hopefully inspire them to, to, uh, to pursue, you know, pursue environmental studies or pursue ecology as something that becomes part of their lives. Look at the sheer size of that thing. Our last story is about turning eavesdropping into public art on campus. This is the soundworm, and it connects the campus through sound. What's great about the soundworm is that it exists. You know, this is the first time that a student um, piece of public art has ever been built and installed at Rice. Hello. Hello. Well, rather than just a big yellow pipe that's right next to Fondren or across from Valhalla, it's actually a piece that stitches together like five different public spaces across campus to one continuous form. We've got five microphones across campus and they're relaying uh, to different parts of the sculpture. And as you walk through the sculpture, you can encounter five different parts of campus. You kind of know which places that they're tapping, but because you hear it in a different setting, it's completely defamiliarized and it's just so strange. You see people walking by all the time just staring at it, having no clue what they're looking at. And so, you know, right now, you know, people are like touching it, they're walking over it, like you get to sit on it. I think that's really cool. It's an actual interactive sculpture. This has been an incredibly collaborative project with so many different people involved. Um, so many different students, so the teams were interdisciplinary to start with, and then with that group of electrical engineering students. And then within the administration, we just had these key partners in various departments because a project like this, a, a built project, has so many different factors. You have to work with facilities and engineering. You have to work with the IT department because we were doing all this um, electrical work that was also going through the campus Wi-Fi network. We had to work with the police department. They actually, we got the police called on us the first day because they didn't realize that we were digging on campus. Um, but they were so nice about it once they realized what we were doing. We had to, we worked with the provost's office to get approval and the School of Architecture and um, donors and sponsors. People in different organizations can like create a larger project than you could imagine. That's why we worked with um, Ethernest, which is an on-campus group. Um, it's just a group of tech-savvy makers, and they really helped to make this happen. So basically how the setup works is that we have uh, a couple of different microphones that are just plugged into microcontrollers, which are just little computer brains that, that only take the sound that's coming out of the microphone and just send it all into a central source. And the central source is down here under the, um, under the ground. The five microphones all send the data in, and then it all comes into here, and then it all gets sent one at a time out into the perspective uh, speakers. A chance to see this campus come together acoustically, um, but also through the interdisciplinary work that brought this together. Um, and I really want to just thank this team for doing something and contributing to the campus in a way that um, I think is, is just simply remarkable. And as a great enthusiast of public art, I think this piece belongs here as much as in every other amazing piece of public sculpture here. It is absolutely right on the same level. And it gives us either, even more, it's so interactive. And it's, you know, and it's created at home, right here. It, there is one question that they haven't answered in why this color, why yellow? I mean, was that, was that paint on sale or what? Was that? We had a lot of con uh, discussions with uh, Sarah Whiting about this. We had, um, we had a Home Depot orange that we were really excited about. It was called Obstinate Orange. We just tried so many different swatches, and we landed on this one because it was bright and cheery, but it also stood apart a lot from its environment. Thank you for joining us on Inside Rice University. To learn more about rice, visit rice.edu. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with all the latest things going on at Rice University. We'll see you next time.